Good evening. Uh, this is the May 12th, 2021 <coughs> meeting of the Moscow Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, before we start the agenda tonight, <coughs> I'd like to welcome our newest member, Drew Davis, uh, our newest commissioner. So welcome. Happy to have you on board. We're back up to a full complement of, uh, of nine commissioners now. So with that, we'll start uh, the agenda. First item is uh, approval of the April 28th, 2021 minutes. Do we have any additions, deletions, corrections? Okay, not uh, hearing of any. Uh, would somebody like to move to approve? Move to approve. So Victoria moved, Second. Mike seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, approved. Um, next item on the agenda is our public comment period. Uh, we set aside 15 minutes for each meeting for people to uh, address issues, but not that are on the agenda tonight or uh, pending before us. So is there anybody that would like to, uh, to speak other than the issues before us this evening? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to the next item, which is our public hearing. Um, before we start this, and I'll, I'll read the details, uh, um, I would like to make note of the fact that the applicant um, is a Planning and Zoning Commissioner. Um, Rich has consulted with me and with the City Attorney to make sure that we avoided any potential conflicts of interest or appearance of conflicts of interest. We're satisfied that uh, he meets all those requirements. So Rich is not with us on the dais uh, this evening and will be recusing himself from any deliberations and decisions we make. So with that, the item is proposal for a comprehensive plan use designation, zoning designation, and a preliminary subdivision plat for a 235-acre property proposed to be annexed into the city of Moscow and generally located south south of the West Palouse River Drive, ball fields, property, and west of the Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories property within the city of Moscow. Uh, we'll start with a presentation from Mike on the uh, proposal. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commission members. Can everybody on Zoom see that all right? Yeah. Great. Yes. Uh, so this is what the applicant's referring to as the Eddington uh, proposal. It's a comprehensive plan land use designation, zoning designation, and a preliminary subdivision plat uh, for property that's proposed to be annexed into the city of Moscow. Uh, this is the subject property highlighted in red at the center of your screen. You can see Palouse River Drive uh, faintly here to the north running east-west. You got Highway 95 here. Uh, this is the property that uh, Schweitzer recently annexed and purchased and is in the process of constructing uh, their first building. Uh, over to the north, you have the Arboretum of the University of Idaho, and you also have uh, various residential developments in the Anderson Frontier Editions on the north side of Palouse River Drive, uh, as well as some rural property to the west and the south, but primarily agricultural lands uh, surrounding to the west and to the south. Uh, the applicant is BBC LLC, and they're proposing three actions for the 235-acre property uh, proposed to be annexed into the city. Uh, the first one is a comp plan land use designation uh, from the combination of auto-urban residential and rural and agricultural to the proposed combination of high-density residential and auto-urban residential. Uh, the second is a zone designation from Ag Forest to a combination of the residential office, which is the RO zone, and the medium density uh, residential R3 zone. And then uh, the commission is tasked with, prior to annexation, uh, to review the subject property and provide the city council with a recommendation regarding the appropriate future land use designation as well as zoning designations to be applied to the subject property upon annexation. So it really just be the comp plan, zoning designation, and the subdivision before you tonight. Uh, you won't actually review the annexation, it's, it's strictly up to city council. Brings us to the Eddington subdivision proposal. It's 27 acre area uh, with 105 lots ranging from 2,328 uh, square feet to 63,105 square feet in size. Uh, within the RO zone, there's 20 proposed lots, 17 of which are townhouse lots. R3 would include 55 townhouse lots and 30 standard single family lots. 
And this is a closer view of the subject property. And this is a view of the uh, current comprehensive planned uh, land use designation uh, for that area. So you can see it's currently a combination of uh, auto urban residential as well as rural and agriculture. Adjacent comp plan designations uh, to the east, Schweizer property uh, is currently designated as suburban commercial. Uh, the park property, the city of Ballfield's property here to the north uh, is, is designated as parks and open space. You have some high density residential designations with the manufactured home parks on the south side of Palouse River Drive and then the uh, auto urban residential designation for the majority of the Anderson Frontier neighborhood north of Palouse River Drive. And of course the Arboretum is uh, designated as uh, university. This would be the proposal uh, to expand the auto urban residential designation as well as include a high density uh, residential designation for just the RO piece uh, adjacent to the park here. Taking a look at what the comp plan says about those designations. The high density residential designated areas are intended to allow the highest density residential development at common densities between 15 and 16 units per acre. Appears appropriate for this or areas appropriate for this designation include those located adjacent to areas of higher activity uh, where there is a range of uses. They should be located adjacent or in close proximity to arterial or collector streets, which Palouse River Drive is. And then new areas of high density residential should be located near mixed use activity areas and corridors that accommodate multimodal transportation. And then it points to uh, a few different uh, appropriate zoning designations, the R3, R4, which is multifamily, or the residential office uh, designation, which is the proposal in this case. Brings us to the auto urban residential designation. Uh, it's intended to be predominantly single family, uh, 7,000 to 11,000 square foot lot sizes, uh, really more isolated from surrounding uses and relying more on automobile transportation. Includes those areas intended to be developed low moderate, moderate density residential uses. Uh, three to six units per acre could include a mixture of single family, twin home or townhouse dwellings. And then it points to the R1, R2, or R3 zones as being an appropriate uh, zoning designation really to uh, highlight the mixture of attached and detached dwellings that could be appropriate for certain areas. Brings us to the uh, zo current zoning map of the property. A uh, portion of it's currently ag forest. So this is where the area city impact boundary uh, ends there. So portions ag forest, the remainder is actually in the county and that's ag forest as well. Uh, farm ranch designation for the ball fields property to the north. The Schweitzer property to the east is motor business as well as the manufactured home parks on the south side of Palouse River Drive. They're also motor business. And then to the north, uh, Anderson Frontier additions are, are within the R1 designation, which is low density, uh, single family residential. You also have various pockets of R3 north of Palouse River Drive as well, uh, adjacent to Sunnyside. This would be the proposed zoning configuration uh, so rezoning from Ag Forest to the portion that includes residential office and then the remainder of the property being the R3 zone. So taking a look at the RO zone as indicated by the zoning code, it's moderately intensive, includes both office and high density housing, serves as a transitional zoning district between residential zones and commercial or industrial zoning districts and appropriately applied in the following circumstances. Uh, on the perimeter of commercial or industrial districts where they abut residential land uses, uh, where transportation network use is greater than desirable for lower density residential uses. Uh, landforms <coughs> create reasonable accessible transportation systems which are buffered from nearby residential areas. And then the development patterns of the neighborhood will allow development of moderate intensity to occur without producing adverse visual or harm to the transportation network. So looking at the various uses that are permitted in the RO zone, really a wide range of residential uses ranging from single family to uh, twin homes and townhouses. Also includes some urban agriculture with market and community gardens, veterinary services, professional offices, uh, restaurants that are limited to 1500 square feet in size, some childcare facilities, community and neighborhood centers, healthcare services, uh, public parks and rec facilities. 
as well as personal care and bed and breakfast ends. R3 zone really provides for an increase over the R2 zoning district by allowing those certain types of uh, housing to be constructed. So it's appropriate where activity levels are moderate, terrain permits construction of somewhat larger structures, and the public systems and neighborhood facilities can be accommodated at a greater intensity of land, uh, use as guided by the comprehensive plan. And then a really a, a range of residential uses as well, so single family, uh, does not allow multifamily, it's just single family, two family, uh, twin home townhouses, as well as some urban agriculture, small child care facilities, and public parks and rec facilities within R3. So that brings us to the Eddington proposed preliminary plat. Uh, it is that 27 acre area, 105 feet. And then developments that provide more than 24 units need to provide off street guest parking, and that's at a rate of one stall per four townhouse units and it has to be located in the required uh, spacing between townhouse buildings or at the rear of the townhouse buildings. And then townhouse developments, more than 24 units, also need to provide some functional open space, uh, and that's at a rate of 75 square feet per unit. It needs to be functional, smallest dimension of which shall not be less than 30 feet and shall include landscape and turfed areas, as well as two different types of furnishings. Uh, which in could include benches, picnic tables, children's play equipment, or other similar items. So that brings us to the proposed uh, preliminary plat. You can see Palouse River Drive uh, running east-west here to the north. Uh, city's Park property here to the north as well. South Fork of the Palouse River flows through the city's park property. Uh, you've got two primary access points to Palouse River Drive, an existing access point off of uh, the wet northwest corner here. They have proposed uh, a collector street, which is Augustine Avenue. Uh, ends up kind of teeing up to allow for a potential roadway to expand to the south at some point in the future. Uh, then heads east, this is Eddington Avenue. Heads all the way, you have two proposed side streets. Uh, these north, so there's alleys that run behind all these proposed lots here on the south, as well as to the north adjacent to the park. Uh, you have various points of access, so the alley comes out onto the street at a few different locations. Uh, two of these locations are extensions of these side streets here. So that's Chesterton Drive, is what this street says, and Luther Drive here to the further to the east. Uh, Eddington Avenue ends up uh, heading due east, going into an intersection with a street stub here to the uh, property boundary uh, adjacent to the Schweitzer property. And you also have the extension of Conestoga Street, uh, which extends on the alignment uh, coming on the north side of Palouse River Drive, uh, with a proposed bridge being constructed across uh, the south fork of the Palouse River. It's a view of the utilities and how those will be served. So the main point of uh, access for utilities would be a water line that exists in Palouse River Drive. That'll be extended down uh, Conestoga Street into the proposed subdivision. You also have a sewer line that will be included throughout the subdivision, uh, end up extending throughout the, the city's park property to a proposed future lift station to, to uh, convey that sewage up to Palouse River Drive and then down to the main uh, lift station uh, down by Fountains Industrial Park on Highway 95. So this is a closer view of the northwest side. You can see that uh, these would be the townhouse lots, so these would be standard lots here. You do have a larger lot here. Looks like that's the 63,000 square foot lot. You also have another larger lot here. And then to the east here would be a lot dedicated for stormwater detention. Uh, these would be townhouse lots, so the skinny lots that you can see here. These would be the easements, where the four foot sidewalk that would be required. Uh, to connect to the alley at the rear to the public street in the front. So you can see where all the, uh, the public easements would be proposed between the town, the grouping of the townhouse lots. Moving further to the east, see more townhouse lots. These would be, essentially this is the dividing line of the residential office zone. Uh, runs in the center of the street, then ends up uh, terminating here in the northeast. Provide some access uh, through these 
properties here. These are not proposed to be developed. These are proposed to be open space and some off street parking opportunities for the townhouse uh, lots. And then you can see the townhouse lots extending down the street uh, with those easements uh, between the groupings of buildings. Further to the east. Once you hit Chesterton Drive, you end up transitioning into more single family lots. So these are all in the R3 zone. Uh, these are proposed to be townhouse lots and then they transition to the single fam larger single family lots here. And then the transition continues uh, all the way to Conestoga Street to the east. You can see there's all these lots are alley loaded as well, coming back out on the street. You have the alley here on the north side as well. Uh, and then this is alley access. This is actually uh, quite a bit narrower than a typical street. Uh, it's just providing the alley connection to the rear of the lots. More of construction drawings to give you an idea of the uh, paving and development that would occur. There is proposed to be a pathway uh, that would extend from Conestoga Street all the way pretty much between the ball fields property and the uh, public alley that's being proposed here on the north side. And that would extend adjacent <coughs> all the way through those lots there on the north side. Taking a look at the extension of Conestoga as well as Augustine, uh, they're proposed to be collector streets, which is a 34 foot wide street section. They have bike lanes on both sides of the street, no on street parking, and curb gutter sidewalks on both sides as well. Uh, and then some of the local streets in the proposed subdivision, a uh, 36 foot wide street section that includes parking on both sides of the street, and as well as curb gutter sidewalks on both sides as well. Palouse River Drive is currently designated as a minor arterial street. It's currently not developed to that standard though. Uh, the standard is 30 foot wide roadway section with curb gutter sidewalks on both sides of the street. It's currently paved, but there's intermittent curbing and sidewalks typically only on one side of the street. And it's mainly on the north side where uh, some of the frontage improvements have occurred over the years, primarily as a result of subdivision development uh, on the north side. So we've got those two proposed access points. So as part of the extension, I think I discussed this before, uh, but a bridge will be constructed across South Fork of the Palouse River. You can see the thoroughfare plan. Uh, this is in the comprehensive plan. You can see the uh, street extensions here. So we had planned for the extension of Conestoga Street, at essentially the same alignment as being proposed as well as a future collector extension uh, on a similar alignment uh, for Augustine. That's why we're recommending that there be a T intersection here for that roadway to potentially continue to the south at some point in the future as a collector street. Also have, uh, this is the alternate highway bypass that ends up extending through uh, the Schweitzer property connecting to Highway 95 and then heading up to the northwest, eventually connecting uh, out by Airport Road is the goal. So on April 8th, 2021, a couple of weeks ago, the city received a request from the applicant requesting the city's financial participation in the construction of the extension of Conestoga Street and the accompanying bridge construction as it provides mutual benefit to both the city as well as the applicant. They had a council meeting on May 3rd and staff presented that information of the history of the ball fields property to the north uh, for the council's deliberation regarding the participation of those costs of Conestoga Street. Uh, the council then directed staff to negotiate an agreement with the applicant for further city council consideration. So there's some terms of the agreement uh, which include the limits to the city's financial participation and it was 50% of the actual cost of the street extension uh, up to a little over a million dollars. And the city's financial participation would not come due until all improvements were completed and accepted by the city. And then to encourage the applicant to uh, provide some affordable housing element to the project. And then as part of the agreement, the applicant agreed to construct at the applicant's expense, the frontage improvements on the south side of West Palouse River Drive, including installation of curbing, sidewalk and roadway widening to improve West Palouse River Drive to 34 feet in width 
from the intersection of Conestoga Street and continually <coughs> continuously extending to US 95 South Main Street. And so that hasn't been officially approved by council. It was reviewed by committee this last Monday and we'll be going to the full council for their consideration on Monday. So this was uh, what was presented. So this has been the original concept uh, behind the city's Playfields property to the north. Uh, it was always intended to provide uh, a roadway, the Conestoga Street, the bridge to provide access to the main portion of the site, which happens to be on the south side of the South Fork of the Palouse uh, River. So taking a look at utilities, like I mentioned before, we have existing mains in Palouse River Drive, proposed to be extended down Conestoga Street. Our 2012 comprehensive water system plan indicates that uh, the existing system has adequate potable and fire flows to serve the proposed development. Sanitary sewer uh, is in Palouse River Drive as well. And then we'll have that main being ex proposed to be extended uh, along uh, the ball fields property in an east-west fashion and then ending up constructing a proposed lift station that would serve the proposed subdivision as well as any other property that's developed to the south. 2011 comprehensive sewer system plan uh, indicates the existing system is adequate to serve the additional flow. And then storm <coughs> sewer, of course, will be piped and directed to numerous stormwater detention ponds located within the proposed subdivision. Uh, city standards require that uh, the stormwater runoff uh, be required to be detained at the pre-development rate. And then eventually the stormwater will be conveyed to uh, the detention facilities to the South Fork of the Palouse River. Parkland dedication uh, is 13.36 acres of net developable land. RO zone requires 9%, R3 requires 7. So there's 1.02 acres of dedication required. Uh, the applicant has submitted a letter proposing to defer the parkland dedication to a later phase, uh, stating the uh, adjacent uh, city ball fields property directly to the north of this proposed subdivision. And that was reviewed by the Parks and Rec Commission as well as the Pathways Commission and they recommended approval uh, for deferring the parkland dedication during their April 13th, 2021 and April 22nd uh, regular meetings. And so with that, staff recommends the commission conduct the public hearing and upon consideration of testimony received, recommend approval of the proposed comp plan land use designation change. I recommend approval of the proposed rezone from Ag Forest to the RO and R3 zone with no conditions and recommend approval of the proposed preliminary plat of the 27 acre area to create 105 lots ranging from 2328 square feet to 63,105 square feet in size referred to as Eddington subdivision with one condition. That's from engineering that water and sanitary sewer mains shall be extended to the western edge of the subject property to allow the future extensions of services to adjacent properties. And then in accordance with the commission's decision, of course, direct staff to prepare the comp plan, rezone, and preliminary plat uh, RCS documents. And I'd certainly try to answer any questions that you might have on this. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so any questions for Mike before we move to the public hearing? No? Mike, uh, when, when you uh, talked about sewer and water, you're saying that sewer and water are available for the entire 200 acre development? Or are you saying for the 27 acre development? We're talking about just for the 27 acres. So it, it'd be provided for the entire property, but depending upon what gets developed on the entire 235 acres, we don't know. So we would have to model that to make sure it would be sufficient, but we're pretty much just modeled this particular proposed subdivision tonight that it has adequate sewer and water. Okay. it's. Uh, fairly serious question and uh, just to follow that the 13 acres of park for the entire site or 13 acres for <coughs> this uh, uh, this proposal today uh, there's only one acre uh, approximately one acre required for the parkland dedication yeah, for this yeah we just go off a net developable area so we calculate all the lots square oh, footages I got it. I got it. and that gives us thanks Okay, any other questions for Mike? All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, with that, we will move to the public hearing. Um, first, we'll, uh, we'll hear from the applicant or the applicant's uh, designated representative. 
then I'd like to hear from uh, anybody that is in favor of the proposal and then we'll go to those uh, not in favor. Um, when you come to the podium, uh, please state your name and your address and uh, would like to limit uh, each of the uh, presentations or testimonies to three minutes, if you would, please. So with that, uh, we'd like to call on the applicant to, uh, to come and uh, speak. Hello, my name is Scott Sumner. I'll be speaking on behalf of, for BBC LLC. I am the engineer on the project, and I live at 106 South Hayes in Moscow. Um, I'm from Moscow, grew up here, um, and uh, this project, we meet a lot of developers and we talk to them about why they want to do something. And the first, you know, question I usually ask is why, you know, why this or what are you looking to accomplish with this project? And the first, you know, sentence out was, we can't hire people because we can't get them homes. So, you know, looking at it, it's like, you know, we can't bring quality people in to fill positions within Moscow because nobody, there's a lot of people who can't find places to live. Um, a lot of the housing prices are, you know, through the roof from what they have been historically um, for what is actually available. So that kind of opened my eyes in terms of, you know, what kind of the, the developers looking for in their goals. When we looked at this piece of property, um, one of the challenges is with the ball fields there, uh, and the grade of anywhere in Moscow, when you start getting outside of town, anywhere that was flat has already been built on. So you start getting out to outside of um, the surrounding areas, and there's a lot of challenges that come into developing property. Um, the hills are one challenge, some of the stormwater things, and the soils always contribute to some of the development costs which raise housing prices. In looking at this development and, and some of the offsite costs that we're gonna be involved to get to this property, uh, we kind of looked at ways, um, you know, to do something different. If we continue to build houses and developments and things that we've always done, we'll always get the same kind of results. So we tried to look at this in a way of how how can we make this in a way that we can you know, provide housing, and in terms in providing more housing, we can you know put more on the market that will allow housing prices to come down. So that the townhome concept is one of those that we've been looking at just. It's a different way of looking at providing, you know, homes for professionals, um, you know, who have graduated and or looking for a starter home or people who have retired and their kids are out of the house and they're looking to downsize. Um, so in terms of the housing, I, I get emails and calls even for myself. I'm sure the realtors around town are getting calls and emails uh, from people on this subdivision alone. I've gotten calls of people saying, can we buy a lot? already I mean we're at this stage and people are asking by lots because they've said we have looked and looked and looked and we can't we can't buy anything we can't find anything and by the time we even see something things are gone so these are these are some of the solution things that we're trying to solve and trying to be a part of the solution for in Moscow um, I know a lot of people have issues with some of the the sprawl and the, the neighborhoods and and some of the developments but with this um, with some of the alleys that we're trying to provide, a lot more trees and tree covers and providing neighborhoods that you know people want to live in. Um, I think it's really important, you know, with the ball fields there to provide housing where you know, people can go use those fields and we can develop them. Um, where, you know, look at the Joseph Streets, the East Cities, and all those parks that we have around town that you know kids are at all the time. We want to provide, you know, some of those things, and we think we can help with that with the bridge and the access. Um, as well as these houses that can utilize those things. There are a lot of issues that come up during our neighborhood meeting and speaking with the neighbors. Um, Loose River Drive. Right now, a lot of neighbors and people in that area have issues with Loose River Drive as it is right now. With this development and some of the offsite things that we're trying to uh, improve is Loose River Drive and make it more safe, even with the increased traffic that you will see with this. Okay is we're looking to in make improvements, make improvements down at the intersection so that we can take a road that's already unsafe, that was a county road, and make it into a city road and some of the things that can provide slowing down traffic and sidewalks and allow kids to travel through there in a safe way. Um, we do hear a lot about the water issue around Moscow. I know Moscow is very knowledgeable in with the Police Basin Aquifer Committee and some of the things about the water 
in our aquifers. And that is, that is a, a problem with the growth that everyone's proposing, but it's a solution. The solution from that is gonna be a 10, 20, 30 year plan that as a community council, engineering departments and planning that we're gonna have to tackle with neighborhood communities and um, that we'll look into and, and things that we'll do on the development to try and mitigate some of those issues. Um, I will be available to answer questions. I know with some of the neighborhood questions that we went through and some of the emails and things that I won't be able to address all of them in this first more than three plus minutes. Okay, um, <laughs> good wrap up, please. So I'll be available for questions um, through. Thank Wait, you any for- Any questions from commissioners? Okay, thanks, All appreciate right. it very much. All right, so um, we'll move uh, next to anybody that would like to speak in favor of the project. Um, please come up to the dais, please. My name's Chris Carpenter. I live at 811 Sherwood Street here in Moscow. Uh, I'm a real estate agent here in, or commission, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm a real estate agent here in Moscow, own a real estate company here, and uh, we're seeing huge uh, supply problems. So currently there's 10 residential homes on the market. There's uh, 13 residential lots on the market in all of Moscow. Uh, I was just doing some research last week and the average sale price at this time last year for a single family home in Moscow was 288,500. This year, uh, year to date so far, it's 337,500. That's a 17% increase just over the last 12 months, which is pretty, you know, that's insane. That's kind of what we see or what is expect in Seattle or Phoenix, you know, bigger places, but not really Moscow, Idaho. And I attribute a lot of that to supply issues. You know, there's, there's not a lot of development. There's not, it's, you know, it's, it's demand and supply. There's a lot of people who want to buy homes in Moscow. There's a lot of people who want to make moves this way. So I see a development like this, which with potentially smaller lot sizes, potentially higher density being a huge opportunity for people to get into homes at an affordable, affordable cost. Thanks. Super, thank you very much, appreciate it. Okay, anybody else that was, uh, would like to speak in favor or of a general nature? All right. Uh, oh. My name's Kirk Harden. I live at 1400 Harden Road, Moscow, Idaho. Uh, I've been here for 64 years. I've farmed ground out in that area there. I know the area quite well because I was 30 years in UPS, so I knew every nook and cranny. Um, as far as farming goes, farmers don't like to be farming around residential areas. That ground there is already surrounded by residential homes. And the equipment is getting bigger, so you need to improvise, and we don't have the resources to have people farm smaller pieces of property. So I think it's a great location. Um, I think it'll be necessary for Moscow to grow in the right direction. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. you bet. Anybody else? Um, <coughs> uh, my name is Rick Beebe. I'm one of the bees, actually. Uh, Kurt's got me beat a little bit. I started school here in 1961, and I'm still here, so apparently we're old people. At any rate, I wanted to talk a little bit about affordability, if I could. Well, every, every time you ask anybody, whether you talk Scott or Nils, whoever you're talking about, affordability, workforce housing gets somewhat convoluted about what each of us think affordable housing is. So affordable housing and workforce housing is not only one of the ingredients for this subdivision, it is the ingredient for this subdivision. So we're gonna try lots of different ways of doing it. I worked with some of you guys before on affordable workforce housing. Nils is here, we're working with Nils to, uh, Peterson, not Reese, but to get together uh, affordable housing, workforce housing. It is the concentration of this project. If we can provide well-built, unique homes, 
that satisfy this, the market of Moscow, Idaho at the least expense we can do, that is our objective. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Haley Lewis with our government affairs team at SEL. I actually just have a logistical question. Um, so assuming this is family housing or families move in here, what school would this would fit? Where would they get bus to? Would it get split? Do we know what the school range looks like right now? I guess it's more of a city question for Mike or other. Would they fall into Russell? Would that be I, the closest elementary school? I would school? think West Park would yeah. be the, the nearest. The closest. <coughs> I, just I, I, I'm just guessing, but. Uh, yeah, I would say West Park. Okay, groovy, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Hi, my name is Mick Hess. I live at uh, 3109 West Twin Road, just outside the city limits of Moscow. And uh, what I'd like to speak about to this is in my neighborhood where, where we have s developed more of a farm residential kind of thing, it seems to me that it's really going to block city from being able to grow that direction because now you've got all these 5-acre, 10-acre, 30-acre, 40-acre plots that are in the road of trying to keep this a con continuous thing to the city. This looks to me to be a perfect answer for that kind of a problem that you've got your biggest chunk of land between you and the city is a park. Um, so I just am a, uh, trying to encourage people that you know where, where this is located now is I think a really good place to put this. And I also, we have some rentals and we have built some townhouse things. And I, I see this being the future of, of workforce housing is smaller lots uh, with, with amenities that are uh, built into it. And the city is already committed to having a property out there. So, you know, lining it with houses is pretty similar to what goes on in Mountain View Park. And I think it's really a, a great thing for the community and a good thing for the people that live close to that. That's all I've got. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Nancy Tribble. I live at 922 Clay Court, Moscow, Idaho. And like Chris, I too am a real estate agent. And we definitely need some diversity. I just have a couple of questions. And the other gal brought up a good question is, as we do bring more and more people in, what is the thought of when our schools are overflowing and we don't have room in our post World War II schools. <laughs> They're pretty small right now and we know our, our bonds have been passing and so forth for, for upgrading, but have we thought about as more and more families come in, where will we school the children? And I would really hope that we make sure that these townhomes have decent sized yards. Uh, that's what I come up against right now with some of my, my buyers is a lot of these highly dense homes that are going in, there are practically zero yard. So I would hope, I'm sure the builder can address that. And something else that being a real estate agent and a lot of developers are sharing, the cost of timber, lumber, sheeting, is through the roof. And that's been one of the challenges of putting so much pressure on existing inventory because new construction is out of the price range of a lot of our buyers. For that same square footage of maybe 1,800 square feet, 2,200 square feet could be close to $500,000 between the upper fours and, and the fives because sheeting for a lot of the, the buildings have gone up to almost like $60 a sheet. So how I, I think it's a great idea we need more but how are we going to bring that in uh, when just the materials themselves are so expensive so I think it's great but I have a couple questions on that thank you thank you okay anybody else general nature or support okay. oh. My name is Doug Gadwa. I live at 1400 Sand Road, 
which is the county line for West Plus River Drive. My concerns, I, I'm for the project because we need housing, but there are concerns that we need to take a look at as neighbors is, and I'm, I happen to be a school bus driver uh, in my retirement. And I look at intersections like the Conestoga intersection. Currently at the Conestoga intersection, there is a giant power pole right a beam the Conestoga intersection. Either that's got to be moved or a school bus is going to be into the oncoming lane to make that turn. Uh, I suggest following the property line all the way up to a West Plus River Drive where you don't have a major power line pole in the way. Um, the west entrance for the uh, project has a very blind corner and I live right next to that corner and I have seen people slam on their brakes trying to access that because somebody's coming around the corner. It, it's an issue that the primary access to the subdivision has to be Conestoga and not that dangerous across the bridge intersection. Um, as a school bus driver, I look at this and say, um, this engineer has not designed any school bus pull off the road parking spots. Um, and I mean, this is just phase one. We got another uh, 200 plus acres is that a school bus right now is stopping in the middle of the street and going to block traffic until all kids are loaded on the bus. I, uh, <clears throat> and it, it does loop um, to get, not have to turn around, but it's looping with a dangerous intersection. Um, uh, currently, we have West Plus River Drive, the Arboretum, and the Bike Park. Tonight, as I drove to this meeting, there was about 10 cars parked half on the ditch and half on the road uh, with a function going on at the Arboretum slash um, bicycle park. Um, the, you know, you talk about improving the road from uh, Conestoga to the highway. What about the improvements, which is now a city street, onto the other access point for this area uh, with sidewalks and additional parking with, uh, because it's a county road that has been acquired by the city and it is not to standards for the rest of that um, basically a half mile. Um, <clears throat> future phases. I really do not think Pluce River Drive is going to handle the 200 additional acres of development um, without another roadway access maybe to Highway 95. Um, I um, hope it goes through, but I hope that there are some additional engineering thoughts that, uh, and design thoughts. Um, and I'm, uh, <clears throat> a year and a half ago, uh, plywood slash OSB was $7 a sheet. And now it's 50 plus dollars a sheet. And I feel for the building. We'll go from there. Okay. I Thanks, hope that Rick. it is done with lots of thought. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? General nature or support? Uh, if not, we'll move to anybody that has concerns about the project. David? <clears throat> Get my paraphernalia on here. David Hall, 1334 Wallen Road, Commissioners. 
<coughs> at what stage should the amount of water to be used by a proposed action be considered most carefully? It has been stated that, quote, the city council would be the appropriate hearing body to address water sustainability, unquote. That seems late in the process. It should be reviewed at every stage, including annexation, but opening the city to required provision of water for any use up to the limits of the law be beneficial to Moscow. And under the proposed de development proposal, such as this, the city of Pullman does an environmental review at this stage. Moscow should do the same. Um, for this proposal, initial 27 acres would be developed for 105 domestic units at two and a quarter occupants per domestic unit times 114 gallons per occupant times 365 days per year, 10 million gallons of water a year, using numbers that the this, this city staff comes up with. Um, in the 2020, year 2020, Moscow pumped 747 million gallons and have imposed a 1% limit of pumpage increase per year, which would be 7.47 million gallons. This one proposal, one-tenth of the whole, but we're only looking at this, you're looking at this piece right now, is 10 million gallons. That's more than the 1% for all developments that the city has imposed on itself through PBAC and their groundwater plan. So that's a huge amount of water and that has to be addressed at some stage in the process and it seems to never get looked at, numbers are looked at, but nothing happens. Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay, anybody else that has concerns about the project that would like to speak? My name's Tim Clyde. I work, I live at 1491 Sand Road. My driveway is the one access into that place right now. I will start by saying I am not totally against this. I know we're growing, but I think there's a lot of concerns that need to be taken care of before we go any further. Clouse River Drive has to be, something's got to be done with it. They've talked from Conestoga to 95. We've got to do something from there to that bridge and that bridge will not support what's coming. It has been allowed to get destroyed by the truck traffic that's running in it now to that landfill that's behind our house. So personally for us, we have an issue. Our water line runs the full length of this property. It's at that last trailer court, cleared our house. We brought it up. Everybody, they say, we know we, we, it's there, we need to talk about it, nobody talks about it. So that's something that has to be addressed. Um, I'm, like I say, the big, the, that road, I am surprised we have not got somebody killed. Two trucks cannot go in and out of that interest at, at the same time. The bridge that's there will not support moving in big heavy equipment. They can't get enough axles to turn. It's just, it's, it's waiting to collapse. We've, I think we, we sent in a letter with pictures of, you can see the steel and it's rusting. So, um, and it, we are kind of concerned about all the dust. Right now we eat a lot of dust. And we talked about this at a neighborhood meeting. And yes, where they're physically moving dirt, there's not much they can do. But their haul roads and stuff, there needs to be dust control of some sort. So. You know, a lot of it has, like I say, a lot of it's been brought up with the with the width of that road, the parking has to be eliminated on that road. You got Anderson Park up there where people park, and two trucks can't pass each other. Two cars can barely pass each other. And like Doug was saying tonight, when we come to the meeting, there's an advantage to Arboretum. One car will make it through. It scares me that somebody's kid's going to dart out 
and I'm going to take them out. I try not to use it when something like this is going on. This, you know, so I just I hope some of this gets addressed before this goes any further. And I think the work on the road needs to be done before any of the development starts. I myself just I did a small development. And for 240 feet of road, I hauled 36 loads of rock. And I don't have to go to city code on the road standards. So that tells you how many loads of rock are going to come in. There's going to be thousands of trucks running in and out. That's not counting concrete, anything else. So somehow we've got to, the infrastructure just got to be done first. Thank you. So, you know, we've got storm water. I mean, it's just the whole thing. Yeah. So, all right. Okay, great. Thanks Thank very you. much. Hi, I'm Cynthia Micah from <clears throat> 620 Ridge Road. I have a um, question, Mike, about the um, Conestoga you said is, an is um, already an arterial road as it's, as it's built now? No, the, the portion north of Palooza Ridge Drive is a local street. Okay. The new se segment to the south is proposed to be a collector street. Okay, got it. So I'm concerned about Conestoga um, because um, I think people will be going through all those little neighborhood um, streets to go to the university or to Palouse Mall or, or over to Pullman rather than going out to the highway. Now, a lot of people will go out to the highway and, and take the, the um, easier road, but I think that there may be a lot of traffic coming through the neighborhoods, and I'm concerned about um, the amount of traffic, um, the safety of, of people, um, and I wonder if that's being considered at all. Please let me know. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hi there, Doug Olson, 1670 Sand Road, Moscow. Yeah, I would prefer this, of course, not be there because it's destroying uh, agriculture, which is what built this town and the community more than some of the other things. But uh, <coughs> but the affordable housing, I don't see this being a, a good uh, ideal. Uh, way that, like it was said earlier, the cost of everything going way up. Uh, there's, even when the market fell back in 2008, there, the housing market stayed up, it never fell. So I don't see how it can be affordable. Uh, but like uh, we need to do the other part of the structure. We know the city sewer system is not really capable of adding all this extra sewage that's already at capacity when it was built, when it was finished, is what I've been told by several plumbers around the area. Uh, but then we also have to look at, you gotta build a new fire department because now you're building in a bigger area. You built one north of town, but now you're gonna have to build something that's south of town to help support it, the bigger structure, homes. Uh, then you also have to look at, gonna have to build new schools because these grade schools and the junior high and the high school is not going to handle another thousand kids is what you're looking at here easy if you figure two to four kids for most households the way it seems the way it's going so you're looking at you know a lot more kids you're gonna have to do more with schools uh, of course more city grows, more crime wave goes through. Now you gotta get bigger police force. And one thing the city didn't look at is when they built a new police department, didn't look at building a jail because the county jail can't support all of it. 
So the city should have built a, their own jail too. Uh, for the roadway, yes, it is not safe right now. And actually it's gonna get worse when this development goes in because traffic does speed through there and it's nice straight road, they speed. And that's gonna be definitely anywhere. Uh, dust control when this all this construction goes through is gonna be pretty bad. It was bad enough when they did a lot of ro uh, rock crushing several years ago back in the late 70s. And <coughs> My parents' place is right on the corner at 1650 Sand Road, and dust was always blowing over there. Uh, and then our water for that resident is across the roadway close to the, the west entrance, and that's where we get all the water for the house. That's where the spring is that feeds it for the, our well. So. I'm against it on account of just the, it's not affordable for anybody really to be in here. And like I say, you're gonna have to get a new fire department and bigger police force to be able to handle all these people. Great, but thank, thank, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, anybody else? Hello, my name is Martina Jalek and I live at 1650 Sand Road and I haven't heard anything about the environmental impact because there's a moose who lives in the area and last year she had her twins with her. She came from up at the Arboretum. So I'm wondering, is there any plans for the animals? You know, there's deer, moose. I mean, I haven't heard anything about the environment. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? My name is Catherine Brown, Council, and I have been a resident of Moscow since the late 40s. I live at 489 Ridge Road currently, and if Conestoga becomes a main artery f from this subdivision, the entire group um, north of Conestoga will be affected in a negative way, and our house prices will dip. We don't have the road structure to facilitate the amount of traffic that will come from this particular uh, unit of homes unless we move it around the rim. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else care to speak? All right, with that, um, we will close the public hearing and go into del deliberation uh, as the commission. And uh, let's Mr. See. Chair, yes. typically the applicant has a chance to offer rebutting testimony if okay. they would like. Okay, uh, that would certainly be welcome. So if you'd care to come up and address any of the issues that you've heard this <coughs> evening, thanks, Mike. I'll try and address some of the questions, concerns, comments. Um, I know schools came up, and with more residents and more schools, I, I mean, I, I went through the schools. My dad was in first class at Moscow Junior High. Like I know the condition in a lot of these schools and the high school. We continuously do work on them, and yes, those are a huge issue. And one of the ways I feel like schools will be able to find a new school is developments like this, where there's space, where eventually as this develops out there could be a space for a school or a fire station and then those amenities as this grows um, there 
sorry, I'm clicking stuff. Um, there could be opportunities for those kind of things to in future phases and developments and uh, as part of this. There's nothing right now that we have planned or it'd have to be in coordination with the city and uh, fire departments, police stations and uh, going forward. Um, as far as bus pullouts and turnarounds and things with, um, through that 18th Avenue, you know, picking up kids, there's areas we could mark off for no parking where bus zones could pull off. So we feel like that's a, with a nice loop and things where buses aren't gonna have to turn around and it, it'll be an easy way for buses to be handled through the, um, through the development. And one of the things I don't think got brought up either is part of this development and in, in continuation of this is connecting pathways and, and connecting to the Arboretum and allowing um, the walkable routes through this development that will connect up to the Arboretum and other areas of Moscow where we can um, you know, support what's already there in Moscow with, with some of the things part of this development. Um, I know with dust control with every development, um, I know that came up a few times with the local residents with dust control, um, with the farm fields and the dust and, and the dry weather that we get during the summer, there's not a lot you know, farmers can do or, or as development what we could do during it. Um, we'll try and mitigate it with wa watering and other things that we can do during development, but uh, those are things that we coordinate with the contractor as well as with the city. Uh, Increased traffic safety. Um, um, we do think part of this development and the improvements to Palouse Road Drive will help with some of the safety aspects of it. Um, leaving it as is and without this development, um, you're gonna have the same issues that people have brought up throughout the day with Palouse River Drive. Um, the bridges that are on Palouse River Drive will uh, hopefully with this demand that's here will force you know the cities and, and the county to kind of look at those as more of a priority instead of you know as a back burner item. So we're hoping with the improvements and uh, some of the things that we're going to do that we can provide a safe place for kids to walk and keep kids to ride bikes and um, in that corridor as it's built out. Um, I think those are the items and I know the water is I mean Moscow it's a concern and I think it's something in the long term that as a community we really need to um, work together with Moscow Pullman the other um, entities and really look for a solution so okay thank you very much and thanks to all of you for your comments this evening um, with that I will close the public hearing and we will discuss this amongst our the commissioners here and then uh, move to uh, a decision. So do we have any issues, comments? That, uh, Mr. Mike? Chair, sorry, I do have one other thing. We received three uh, oh. additional public yes. comments via email that were within the five days. So it'd be up to the commission's discretion. I, I would like to uh, include those uh, as a part of the official record, yes. Right. Thank you. Great, thanks. Okay, I keep trying to close the hearing. <laughs> so, just kidding. All right. So, uh, any comments from commissioners? Question. Yes. To Mike, can you talk to us about Palouse River Drive? It's, it doesn't sound good. So, t so, it, where, 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 Mike? Who's going to take care of it? Talk to us about Palouse River Drive. Tell us what you can tell. Well, us. like I mentioned in the presentation, the council's currently considering a participation agreement with the Conestoga Street extension. Part of that would be the re developers responsible for uh, improvements to the south side of Palouse River Drive, which would be the widening, uh, curbing, gutter, sidewalk uh, on the entire south side from the Conestoga Street intersection all the way down to US 95. So there's intermittent curbing sidewalks and widening on the north side, and that's already occurred as part of the subdivision development that's already happened in some of the frontier additions. Typically have a 10 or 12 uh, acre development. And, uh, it, you know, what are you gonna do? It's, a, it's a, a, a small thing. We grow in increments. And you see this project growing in, uh, how many years do you think this uh, project will take? What's your, what's just a rough guess? Uh, 
I would think it's in the 10 to 20 year range. Right. I mean, okay. just the absorption rate. Yeah, I mean, you and, talk and about I think that's helpful people. to everyone to hear that it isn't going to happen tomorrow. We're going to start the infrastructure, and so that's good. But it would really be uh, a great delight to everybody at this table, to everyone in the room, if there was a little broader view of the conceptual idea. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the conceptual things about it is that you're next door to Schweitzer. So have you been able to talk to Schweitzer? Uh, ha has the Schweitzer company been in any way forthcoming? Um, not on my end, but uh, as well as the ownership may have had more of those conversations, but not on my end. I see. And to speak to the, the larger picture of the development, the first phase and how we're kind of developing this or looking to develop it in the master plan is these first phases will be higher density. There's a lot of um, the offsite costs and other things and getting the development uh, to where it uh, start building houses. There's 1,400 feet of road and a bridge. There's the offsite improvements. Um, as well as when you develop some of these properties, you look at the high density, medium, and low density, and you get a, a mix. And this is going to be the highest density, and we're going to work back into mm -hmm. you know, medium and have mm -hmm. those kind of tiers and levels of, of how it. Uh, so it's not anticipated to be for the other, you know, 200 acres to be 900 townhomes. The thought is this is a very difficult piece because as soon as you get to the property, it goes straight up a hill. So there's a lot of challenging things that we're trying to accomplish with this. And as it moves, oh, I'm so sorry. As we move back, we're trying to, uh, you know, spread out some of the development, and there'll be more of a, a assortment of lots. In yeah, I I certainly appreciate that the early infrastructure here is important and significant, and it puts a burden on the development. Uh, there's hardly ever a uh, subdivision that has to do so many things, cross a river, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. I just continue to be, um, I'm surprised, I guess. The big surprise for me is that uh, there isn't some discussion with the, the folks that are going to bring more people to town and getting, because it seems to me as we look at the whole property, it goes three quarters of a mile down the way, uh -huh. getting over to 95 would be really important. Absolutely. In We'd love to. 10 or 12 if, years. If. And uh, we don't want a Schweitzer building in the middle of that road. So, you know, you hear what I'm saying. Uh, yes, and those discussions internally have been uh, discussed. And, and I know we added this. Originally, we didn't have any connections to, to the east, um, and that was... Uh, connection to the east was added to the Schweitzer property uh, at the request of the city just for future planning, um, but there haven't been any discussions with them, um, but we would definitely be open and, and want ac multiple accesses and things to 95, especially as we continue to go south. It's, it, it's exciting to s think of how the city can grow in positive and uh, sustainable <laughs> ways, but if we keep if we take every little step and don't know what the next uh, steps are, so you know I I might be speaking to uh, our city council member, uh, I might be speaking to Michael, I might be speaking to you, to uh, certainly all of you and the owner, to be able to give. A broad brush you, you know you don't want to you can't say what the details are because my gosh in 10 years there will be some changes mm -hmm. but but a, a, a broad I hope you have a broad idea and so anyway um, maybe somebody else would like to speak for that thank you Uh, this Rick Beebe again. And Nils, I know exactly what you're talking about. This is a big deal. There's no question about it. So we probably have more meetings than you can possibly imagine. We, of course, have made every effort to discuss this with Schweitzer, and we're continuing conversations with Schweitzer. We've also talked to the school district for dedication for land for first future usage. We've talked to the fire department for 
a fire substation. We've talked to the water people about putting a water tower up. These are all things that are going to, I mean, I, unless you want to, it's, it's just very difficult in a nutshell to tell you. And, and what Doug was talking about is another problem that we're very well aware of. I've been talking to Doug's dad for a long time. We've got to fix Blue Server Drive as it meets Sand Road to the west. There's no question about it. Somebody's going to get killed at that corner. So we're in discussion with that too. It's just, I, I know what you're saying. I, I know that you want us to be good stewards and, and take care of this land the way it needs to be done. But I guess there just is not enough further along in the developmental process that we can tell you that. Although, believe me, all of those things are uppermost in our mind. Right. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, and I, I think in order to get both the city and citizens to be excited about this, yeah, it has to. Ha I has I understand. To try to make some excitement happen rather than doing it in such a uh, specific uh, uh, twenty lots, right. twenty lots, twenty lots. And so I would encourage you to do that. I don't want to sound uh, like I'm uh, beating up on you. No, 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 no. We we actually totally understand. We we just don't want to say something to, and find out that we we misspoke, told you something that wasn't going to happen. Um, believe me, all of the things you're talking about are all the things we've been talking about you, as well. You, you, so. get, you can understand that we, uh, oh, absolutely. I've been here on the, a long time at this table, and we don't get 200 acre developments very often. It's kind of like a snake swallowing a, uh, a, a lion. Gosh. It's, it's a big deal. It, it, There's it no seems question big. about it. It's a big deal. But in the, in the long run, it, it affords us the opportunity to plan for what you're suggesting, which is everything we're trying to do, but we can't get it. We have to get enough. I mean, just to be blunt about it, we have to get enough income so we can try to cover the first eight right, million right. bucks, right? And, and we can't do that either. But we need to at least get started so we we have enough funds that we can kind of plan for the future, is what it amounts to. I mean, quite blunt, hey, Nils, I won't be here. I won't see the rest of the the end of this. But I hope to see quite a bit of it. Me neither. You and me both. <laughs> Thank you, Thanks. guys. Mike, any uh, questions, comments? Well, and, and you know, water <laughs> being a big issue yeah. and some that's discussed a lot. When you do your work, Mike, you guys evaluate this usage and demand and the ability to provide water, in this case, mm -hmm. on the 27 acres. Do you plan out and think about the rest of the development as it comes 10 years, 20 years, whatever from now? Will we be able to, with all the things we're doing as a community already, with water conservation and planning and trying to reach out and put other water reservoir systems in, you guys have done your due diligence on this part already, haven't you? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, like I said before, it's hard to tell without a complete development plan for the entire property whether or not, you know, the big ones are pre water pressure for fire flow and future phases potentially to the south may need some type of reservoir which would include a water tower uh, to get the required fire flow in that area. Um, but for this first phase, it's indicating that they wouldn't need that facility. And of course, you know, that would potentially be the developer's responsibility to construct a, a water tower in order to get that fire flow that would be required as part for the area. So yeah, and our water system plans, you know, model out the entire city and uh, have shown this property as being developable and have adequate potable and fire flows. So Joel, I know you're out there someplace. I can't see you. Any uh, questions or comments? Oh, <clears throat> I'm trying to digest the uh, range of, of issues here. Uh, I would agree with uh, Nell's comment that it would, uh, it would be nice to have a more uh, um, complete view of 
what this 27 acres is a part a part of a larger issue um, with respect to water I am certainly concerned um, I think maybe I was the one that uh, uh, said at a earlier meeting of the, this commission that uh, the issue of whether or not we're uh, ever um, going to get uh, more of a uh, definitive water uh, path forward or, uh, or in, uh, if not uh, uh, if we were to have a uh, moratorium on building uh, until we figure it out uh, that's probably not a PNZ decision, but a council uh, issue. So, Maureen, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, um, I, what, one question I had, uh, and maybe the uh, developers can enlighten me, uh, why is the proposal uh, uh, proposing a RO uh, designation rather than a pure uh, residential. Um, to me, this seems a strange place to locate offices and some of the other things that are uh, that could be developed in uh, um, under RO. Uh, so, Scott, do you want to? Sorry, I just said that there. Uh, the thinking between the RO is just to allow the flexibility um, as the development comes on, and in case um, people have houses and, and work out of their houses or other things that they would like to do, it just for the townhomes in that zoning, it really didn't change much on the design side and things that we would need to do. We can meet the requirements of both, but it just allowed that flexibility uh, in the future if things come up that that would be a possibility for someone. Yeah, uh, residential offices mm -hmm. always allowed in, in residence uh, under a residential uh, designation. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that some of the commercial uh, things that uh, um, would be possibilities under the under that zoning are uh, either either likely or necessarily desirable in this location. Okay, thanks, Joel. Um, Scott, any thoughts? Mike, what's the plan for the ball field? What is, is there a timeline? Please? Well, we currently don't have it in the capital improvement plan, primarily because of the substantial cost associated with the construction of the roadway, Conestoga Street and the bridge over the creek, as well as um, the improvements to Palouse River Drive, which we were going to hold, you know, hold ourselves to uh, for the development of that project. And so, um, you know, should this project move forward and the street, uh, you know, the city contributes 50% towards the construction of Conestoga Street and the bridge, a uh, developer completes the improvements to Palouse River Drive, uh, then we would, yeah, likely put it in the, the capital improvement plan. Uh, I can't give you a time frame, but uh, it would certainly get on the list for development uh, a lot sooner than it is now just because of the cost associated with the access to that site. Sure. Thank you. Drew, any uh, comments, questions? Uh, not this Okay. Um, <laughs> I I, I go ahead. Want to say something. So um, I'm glad, Nels, you brought up the broad brush because I was floundering a little bit here with this little chunk trying to picture the big picture. And I think your explanation, Scott, of, of how you're planning. And, and you have to adapt. If it's a 10 or 20 year project, it, 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 you have to adapt as things mold themselves out. But that helped a lot to hear that so that it's not just this group of houses out in the middle of nowhere sort of, you know, it, it, it 
filled it in and made a, it took the puzzle and it put pieces together. And I, I think people do need to know that. And it shows that you're doing some long range <coughs> planning and that you're invested in it. And, and you do, you have the big cost up front with all the, the roads and the bridge and all that really big cost up front. So your first phase, since this is a multi-phase project, is probably going to want to try to get, get some money in your pocket so you can keep going. But that means you're strategizing and you're planning. And I think that was really good that we got to hear that. Okay. Thank really you. helpful. So um, I, the, my concern or comments, issues, don't relate to the comprehensive plan designation and the, the zoning. I'm, I'm fine with those. I share these concerns from Augustine uh, going east to Conestoga and that access, and I'm wondering about, we already have a commitment to um, deal with Palouse River Drive from Conestoga east, but what about that section between Augustine and Conestoga? It, is it, would it be potentially appropriate for us to set a condition that that improvement be made as a part of approving the plat as well? Well, I mean, that would be another offsite improvement, much like uh, City Council is already working out with the offsite improvements from uh, Conestoga Street all the way down to US 95. You know, it's typically been uh, recognized that that's the city park property frontage and it's the city's responsibility to program in improvements in the future for that property. I would anticipate the majority of the traffic from the subdivision is going to use the Conestoga Street. Right. I mean, there'll still be some portion that'll use the Augustine Street, but the majority of the traffic is going to be heading east on Palouse River Drive. So. Um, I would anticipate that the majority is going to come off of the proposed Conestoga Street extension. And anytime, you know, certainly you're required to, or you're allowed to uh, require improvements within the subdivision, but you start to uh, need to, you know, you need to tread lightly when you have off site improvements. Okay. And state code, I can read you the section here because I've got it, but. Um, it states that no public improvements required by this chapter pursuant to Idaho section of the state code uh, shall be greater than necessary to mitigate the effects of such subdivision development on the ability of the city to deliver services without compromising quality of service delivery or imposing substantial additional cost upon city residents to accommodate the proposed subdivision uh, at the time of subdivision development. So that's ultimately what the commission or council would need to uh, decide, you know, kind of okay. that th threshold that this subdivision is somehow tipping, you know, tipping Palouse River Drive over in that section to require those offsite improvements. Certainly, you know, we're going to we're going to attempt to make that uh, decision for the improvements east of uh, Conestoga Street. But I don't know that you could make that decision, you know, in interpretation or decision okay. for the. Plus River Drive Park property front. So, I, if nothing else, uh, I'd at least like to go on record as uh, saying, and if it's a city issue, then I, I certainly think it's important that the city includes that in the scope of what they're thinking about. I, I've driven that road a number of times as well, and the comments that you heard tonight are absolutely true. I, I think it, it's something that I hope can. Uh, be continued in the discussion for the development of that of that whole area and and even if it's not appropriate for um, the approvals tonight uh, I at least want to go on record as saying I think they're going to be necessary so okay with that uh, we, we've got uh, Joel yeah I, I would like to weigh in a little bit on the Palouse River Drive too I, I'm, uh, I'm sympathetic with the idea that uh, the uh, uh, area along the park ought to be uh, uh, upgraded to uh, uh, the standard. I certainly am sympathetic with the idea that the um, <laughs> uh, that the uh, that the uh, area to the, between Conestoga and 95 needs to be up uh, upgraded. I'm uh, I guess I'm a bit concerned about the uh, whatever city expenditure for uh, these upgradings uh, uh, 
will involve. Uh, I would note uh, that uh, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, Mountain View Road is uh, has been a similar condition uh, uh, historically. And basically it's taking us uh, uh, 40 years to get uh, Mountain View Road upgraded from a uh, rural uh, street to a rural road to a proper city street and uh, we're, we're only beginning to approach it now and uh, I, I would hate to see uh, the costs that uh, our share of these offsite improvements uh, uh, would uh, uh, that our city share uh, would be a drain on doing other needed street improvements throughout our town. So I, I'm, I'm concerned about city share of these things. Okay, thanks, Joel. Appreciate that. All right, so we've got four issues that need to be considered here uh, as a part of uh, the hearing and our decision tonight. So let's just move down the list. The first one is uh, the uh, proposed uh, comprehensive plan land use designation. Um, staff has recommended that we approve that with no conditions. So I'm ready to uh, move forward with that. So move. Okay, we have second. a motion from, and was that a second from Scott? Yes. Okay, so all in favor of um, recommending the uh, approval of proposed comprehensive plan designation? Aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions? Okay, so we've got that one. Uh, second is recommend uh, approval of the proposed rezone. Again, uh, staff has um, recommended with no conditions. So do we have a motion to approve the rezone? Yeah. Oh, Joel, was that you? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, on a roll. Okay. I, I move we uh, recommend approval of the rezone with no conditions. Okay. Second. And Victoria second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstentions? Okay. So that is also passed. Uh, third item uh, relates to um, approval of the proposed preliminary plat. Um, I believe that we had one condition from engineering on that. One recommendation. One recommendation. So do I have a motion on approval or disapproval of the plat? So moved. Um, Victoria moved for approval. Second. And Mike second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Did Joel, was that? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> and opposed and abstentions. Okay. And uh, the last item is to um, direct uh, staff for. Uh, is that is that? Do I have that right? The RCS. For all for all three. For all for all three of the just approved uh, issues. So do we have a motion for our approval or directing staff to? Prepare the RCS. I can't talk tonight. With great enthusiasm, <laughs> I recommend that staff put together a beautiful response. <laughs> and a second? Second. Uh, that's Scott second. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions. Okay, so we have uh, concluded that. Uh, for any of you that are uh, in the audience, uh, if you want to stay around to uh, hear the next public hearing, which relates to a sign ordinance, uh, you're welcome to stay with us or... Let's take a quick break. Yeah, I, and I, I'm going to do a, about a five-minute recess. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming.
Water, so he's backpack. probably just, yeah, he just hit his water. Okay, we're going to uh, restart the meeting. And the uh, next item on the agenda is a public hearing for a legislative hearing providing for the amendment of Moscow City Code Title IV, Chapter 6. And this is relating to the Moscow Sign Code. So, Mike, if you'll do your thing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> so this is our uh, public hearing for the sign code update that we've been working on for the last year. And really all started uh, with the Supreme Court case from 2015, the Reed versus Town of Gilbert, uh, was regarding content-based restrictions on signage. Uh, the ruling ended up meaning that uh, ordinances with different rules based upon content uh, were subject to kind of strict <coughs> scrutiny by the courts and that it couldn't be defined by the content topic or subject matter of the sign's message. Uh, examples for like instance political signs real estate signs uh, you know were, were ended up being issues if you had to actually read the sign and then if there's different standards for different types of signs uh, that was uh, essentially content based so looking at the proposed ordinance we had updates to the definition section uh, exempt sign section uh, a large amount of updates to uh, adding temporary signs uh, just to replace uh, what we had currently for real estate signs, political signs, ideological signs, you know, those types of signage, uh, as well as the table format. So we've gone, been going through the zoning code and updating it from narrative to, to table format for more uh, ease of use and user friendliness. So looking at the temporary sign section, uh, and this was intended to, you know, like I mentioned, address the real estate signs, political signs uh, were the main ones. Uh, residential zoning districts, uh, so we retain the maximum of squ six square feet in size uh, on private property, uh, but proposed three signs per be permitted per lot, except as provided below, and this was to account for the uh, political signs. So. Uh, not necessarily calling them political signs, but still accounting for them. So no limit on the number of these temporary signs uh, in the time period between 60 days preceding the first day of the primary election, general election, or vote for office or ballot measure, and seven days following the uh, election, vote of office or ballot measure. And then non-residential uses uh, within residential zones. So we tend to have some institutional uses that uh, could be allowed, uh, should be permitted to display no more than two temporary signs and or temporary signs which exceed six square feet uh, but are required to obtain a temporary sign permit maybe just maybe displayed for uh, a consecutive time period not to exceed 45 days per year then in commercial zoning districts so 32 square feet in size of total sign area uh, one sign permitted per lot and then we have the same uh, election so the political sign uh, exemption there and then allowing for more than one temporary sign for the commercial properties. So maybe it's grand opening, special event type signage, uh, as long as it's displayed no, for no longer than uh, 45 days per year. You get a, get a temporary sign permit as well. And then we're allowing temporary signs in the public right of way. So same size, uh, six square feet in size, uh, maximum height of three feet. And then we go through kind of some requirements there six signs permitted per event, one sign per intersection, uh, displayed during the time, day of the event and must be removed within two hours after the event, signs entirely outside of the roadway and one foot away from the curb, does not obstruct sidewalk, maintains the four contiguous feet, doesn't obstruct any uh, ADA access, and shall not be placed on city property. So this is generally intended to serve for like the yard sale signs or the open house signs that real estate uh, agents typically display. And then this was the example of the, uh, the proposed table format. So shifting from narrative to table and we have the different types of signs uh, and all the zones that they're permitted in. So this is the residential. So we go through the different sign types, freestanding monument, projecting, suspended and really just a sliding scale depending upon the intensity of the zone they're located in. 
Same with commercial. So there was one amendment uh, that we made since we've last discussed this and in, in made between that time and this hearing. Uh, there has been a pending court decision uh, which our city attorney advised us on and it was Reagan National Advertising versus the City of Austin. City of Austin had regulations addressed on-premise versus off-premise signage and that regulation is being challenged as unconstitutional because it is content-based restriction on speech both on its face and applied and the city ended up winning at trial but lost at the appellate court level and a uh, petition for the United States Supreme Court to take the case up is currently pending. Uh, but with that lower court decision, uh, it would currently be unconstitutional to distinguish between off-premise and on-premise signage. So we currently make a distinction in our code. Uh, typically, historically, we've had uh, motor business and industrial zones have allowed off-premise signage. So classic example is, for instance, like the Taco Time sign on 3rd Street. Uh, right by Subway that points to Taco Time three blocks to the south on 6th Street. That would be an example of an off-premise sign. So now, you know, looking at the, uh, the, uh, the requirement that if you read it and to need to tell what type of sign it is, it applies to this as well. And so at our city attorney's recommendation, we've eliminated the on-premise versus on, on, off-premise uh, distinction in the code. So that, that's really the only change that we've made since then. So the recommendation is after conducting the public hearing and upon consideration of testimony received, recommend approval of the ordinance to city council with no conditions. So anybody have questions for Mike before we proceed? I think with the exception of the on-premise versus off-premise, it's pretty much what we've been working on for the last, gosh, it's been months, uh, maybe the last year, actually. Correct. So, okay. So with that, then, uh, I am going to open the public hearing, and uh, we don't have an applicant. We're the applicant, aren't we? <laughs> so... Uh, is there anybody that would like to speak either uh, in a general nature, uh, in support of, or in opposition of the uh, proposed uh, amendment to the ordinance? Mike, can I start the yes, please. Chris Carpenter at 811 Sherwood Street. Mike, can you tell me about the the purpose behind what's the, what's the purpose behind six signs or what is the where did six come from uh commission discussed that at length for the appropriate number of say open house signs displayed through town and um you know the concern mainly was number of signs per intersection so they proposed to limit that to one uh, but there was actually a, a lower number proposed for a number of event you know special event signs uh, but that was increased to six in case there was some circumstance where there was a property that needed, you know, multiple intersections to be advertised for, say, an open house, maybe a, a property that was out of the way and needed additional signs to um, direct people to that open house. And so that's how they arrived at that number. Okay. And aside from, uh, aside from multiple on one intersection, uh, what's the problem with, say, 10 signs that can lead people to a house or a garage sale from further away? Well, I think that we just uh, thought that uh, 10 was probably a proliferation and six seemed like a, a re reasonable compromise because that was actually an increase if I remember correctly, wasn't it? Well, or we really didn't even allow those in the first place. And so this is inserting that in the code and allowing those in the public right away. And so in order, you know, the give and take of allowing these to remain in the public right away is that there needs to be some limitation on amount of signage to reduce the visual clutter throughout the community. And so that's what the commission arrived at the six. Okay. And we had given a presentation to the Lake Tahoe County Board of Realtors uh, a couple months ago, and they uh, had no issue with the proposed. Was changes. it discussed at that meeting or following that meeting? Do you know? Yeah, I gave a presentation with all the standards that we were proposing for the real estate signs and the open house signs, and yeah. Awesome. 
Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, uh, I am going to uh, close the public hearing, and uh, this looks fairly straightforward. Uh, I don't know if you want to have any additional discussion or if you want to go straight for a vote to... Uh, this would be recommending to City Council uh, approval of this amendment, I believe. Correct. I so move. Okay, we have a motion. Anybody would second. like to second? Oh, Joel seconded. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, Mike and Joel, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions? Okay, we'll consider that one pass. So, um, next item on the agenda, Mike, you're getting your turn at the uh, podium today, is final development review of the 201 West 6, 6 and Jackson development. Great, thank you again. So this would be uh, the review, the final review of the development at Six and Jackson. Uh, if you recall, we uh, conducted the preliminary rev review a couple months ago and recommended, uh, or actually j approved that uh, review with a couple of conditions, and we'll go over that. So uh, just to remind you, the proposal was on the southwest corner of Six and Jackson. Uh, it was about a 24,000 square foot, three-story mixed-use building, uh, ground level, six commercial tenant spaces, one commercial cafe space, uh, eight, eight enclosed parking bays. Second and third floors uh, included eight two-bedroom apartments, two studio apartments, uh, two parking lots containing 15 off-street parking spaces in total, and the extension of Hello Walk. Uh, and so this was the, the current URA's uh, Six and Jackson property, highlighted in uh, red at your screen. Uh, silos to the south, Kreitz to the southwest, uh, Jimmy John's to the north, uh, Ale House to the northwest, and U University Point uh, development to the west. This was the proposal. So some conceptual images uh, looking southwest with the Hello Walk extension, silos in the background. This was a view from uh, 6th Street, looking south. So these were the commercial spaces on the ground floor and then residential above. Uh, parking bays on the uh, ground floor with the access off of 6th Street as well as residential above. Uh, and then that commercial space on the ground floor near the intersection uh, with two residential units above. So March 24th of this year, the commission conducted the preliminary development review re re and recommended approval of the project with one condition. Uh, applicant provide more information on stormwater regulations and bicycle parking at the final review stage. And the applicant has submitted final plans that are in conformance with the preliminary conditions of approval. And this was the uh, civil set that the applicant uh, submitted. So it contains more detail. So uh, I've got a paved drain stormwater filtration system in the parking lots. So there's one large one here as well as two smaller ones here. Uh, and then they've shown the bicycle parking, uh, which was 14 spaces that are required adjacent to Hello Walk in the parking lot. I would also like to point out that um, you know each of the garage bays contained within the development contains enough room for uh, bicycle parking in there as well. And so I'd imagine that each of those residents that uh, rents or owns one of those bays will uh, just have their long-term storage of bicycles within that space. And so we can certainly count that area as well. But they have provided uh, the sufficient amount of exterior bicycle parking uh, within this location here. And then the, the stormwater paved drain filtration system uh, meets stormwater best practices. Uh, so that would be sufficient to meet that standard as well. Question? So the bicycle parking over here, that's for the residences, correct? It's really for anybody in the development. I, I would say, okay, think visitors. Because it's off a walk, it's going to get used yeah. by everybody. I think the resident, you know, I think the just the proximity to the parking lot and Hello Walk it's likely that the long-term storage is going to end up in the individual units or into the garage spaces. Yeah. Uh, and this would likely be more visitor parking okay. for bicycles in that location. Okay. 
And then staff recommends approval of the proposed final development review for the project. Mike, remind me what condition we put on um, the, the preliminary review? It was that the applicant provides uh, stormwater oh. management details and, okay. and sufficient number of bicycle parking spaces. Okay. I say a resounding yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this is a great project. I, I'm, I'm in definitely in favor. So, in this particular case, we're just going to recommend then uh, the. Um, let, let me uh, get the. We, we're recommending the approval. approval of the preliminary subdivision plat and the plat. Correct. Final. You're approving the project, the, essentially. The, the, yeah, the yeah. final, I'm sorry. This yeah. doesn't go to council. This is strictly a commission action, so okay. it'll just be approving the final development review for the project would be the action for the commission. Okay. Okay. So I would still move. Yeah. All right. So we have a motion to second. approve and a second from Victoria. That's pretty straightforward. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions? All right. Uh, it, the the proposal is pr approved, so great. Thank you, Mike. I'm sorry, I was kind of got sidetracked on the next item there. So um, our last action item is the uh, approval of the uh, reason statement of relevant criteria and standards for the uh, development that we approved last meeting. And we've got, what, both the, pr the PUD and preliminary plat and uh, the proposed preliminary plat of the other. Can we do both in one motion, or do you need two motions? Uh, I think we have a question. You could do, there's three of them. So there's the preliminary plat for Harvest Hills second edition, and then there's the preliminary plat and PUD for the replat of lot one, block one. Right. Uh, but you can do all three in one motion if you so choose, or you can do them individually. It doesn't matter. I'd like a slight edit. <laughs> Sure. It's really well written. Page four or five. The thing that jumped out at me on number two. Which, which? Uh, page four. On relevant criteria and standards. Number two. Proposed PUD is consistent, blah, blah, blah. The word attractive is used three times, and I f it, it bothers me because you didn't focus on attractiveness that much. They're attractive, but it doesn't deserve three times. So in the middle of that paragraph, which is where it's mentioned the third time, I would like to change that to the proposed PUD uh, utilizes, just delete that third attractive part, uh, uh, utilizes a private street to access all portions of an oddly shaped property. And in fact, I would put a adjective in front of utilizes and say efficiently utilizes because that was a really key point but attractiveness wasn't so so uh, I just want a little deletion and an added adjective so and that's on I don't that's on the page four uh, yeah and the second paragraph number two second paragraph right in the middle <coughs> It, it has attractive <laughs> development and then it uh, in the first part and then it comes in and it says it's innovative and economic and attractive and environmentally sensitive and, and for a second time and then it comes a proposed PUD is an attractive development which is direct repeat uh, which if utilizes a private street and I just don't like the third time I would like that gone and I would be happy to have uh, an adjective in front of utilizes that stresses that because that is that is important. <coughs> so I'm being picky, <laughs> but that's how I feel. <laughs> but can we just say proposed PUD is a development which utilizes a private street? I mean, it can. Yeah, I was just yeah. suggesting we might want. I mean, to is add that to does that oh. is there something about the word attractive that's um, relevant to the? No. Okay. You can delete it. All right. So. Do we want and I, I let's just do all three of these at the same time with so if we could the motion could say with uh, the edits as it suggested. Could be efficient, you know. Like, I mean, I guess yeah, it could be efficiently any of those utilizes. These, you know, earlier on, these this is primary the primarily the language with the for the intention of PUDs. So it was just yeah, kind of characterizing yeah. 
what parts of the PUD meets kind of those adjectives at the beginning. So, I mean, efficient. Yep. Utilizing fine. a private street would be right. efficient to service. Because so that was a key we could, feature. Uh, attractiveness wasn't. We could, yeah. We could change. <laughs> Sorry, that. it just bothers me. Does that work? Yep. Okay. All right, so would somebody like to make a motion to approve all three of these uh, RCSs uh, with edits? So moved. Okay, we have a motion from Victoria. Second from anybody? Second. Second from Scott. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. And abstentions? Okay, so Mike, is that, that work for you? Is that, okay, okay super. All right, uh, Joel, you're up. <laughs> transportation Commission report. The Transportation Commission will meet tomorrow at uh, 4 o'clock in Council Chambers. Uh, one item of business is a continued discussion of uh, Sustainable Environment Commission's uh, Climate Action Working Group uh, uh, assessment. Um, there, that is followed by two um, uh, development proposals, uh, uh, preliminary subdivision uh, proposals, which I suspect I probably will not be able to attend uh, because for ex parte reasons. So, uh, uh, because they will be coming to the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, at a later time. So uh, um, I, w I will participate to the extent of dealing with the Sustainable Environment uh, Commission's report. Great, thanks, Joel. Uh, so, Mike, any announcements? Uh, any correspondence? None from staff. No. Okay. So, uh, Drew, welcome to your first meeting, uh, <laughs> trial by fire. Uh, thanks, everybody. I, I, I thought. Uh, we had a really, a really good meeting. I, I, I know a, a busy one. And our next meeting uh, is uh, May 26th. And uh, Mike, any previews on what we're dealing with? Uh, I think uh, Joel just provided a preview. So uh -huh. we'll be reviewing a couple subdivision, smaller subdivision plots. Smaller. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, with that, uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thanks, everybody, and uh, have a great two weeks. And we'll see you on the 26th. Thank you.